Amen. All right. Well, we're in the last chapter of Acts chapter number 28. We're in Acts chapter 28, and uh, this is the end. So this will be the last sermon preached out of this book, and it's been, uh, like I said earlier, a great uh, study for me, and I've learned a lot of things. Hopefully you guys have too, and uh, we've just gone literally verse by verse through this whole book. So I don't think I've skipped any verses in this whole book at all. So... And that's what a Bible study is, right? You go verse by verse. And I've done my best to try to expound on those things. Tonight we're going to focus on uh, Paul. Remember last week they were shipwrecked and they were, we kind of learned about some things about boats. And uh, it was pretty interesting. But uh, at the end they, they uh, were trying to go for this, you know, what the, what it, the Bible says was a creek. And then the boat, the boat was broken. But remember, God told them that Paul wasn't going to lose a single person. Not even a hair on their head would drop off. So they all were, are basically swam to shore or they surfed to shore on the boat parts, right? And uh, so here we are at the beginning of Acts chapter 28. And Paul in the island of Melidia or Melita. And so basically the island of of Melita is what people would say now is the modern day island, island of Malta. I don't know for a hundred percent surety that that's true or not. Um, I was kind of doing some studies on the snakes that were on that island and so pe one, one thing that people disagree with about, about this is that they say well that's impossible that Paul got bit by a poisonous snake because there's no history in the fossil records of any kind of any kind of poisonous snake that could kill you being on that island. So, on the island of Malta I'm talking about. So, anyway, I don't care what island it is, I just know that I believe the Bible's true. And I know that Paul was bitten by a snake because the Bible says it was. And that's what happened, so that's what I believe. And whether it was a different, because some people say it was a different island, and Hey, if there's no fossil record or, you know, look, I believe the Bible over science, over any scientist's uh, fossil record also. So, um, anyway, let's look at verse number one. The Bible says that when they were escaped, then they knew that the, that the island was called Melita. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd bless. Lord, help me uh, to expound on the scriptures tonight, Lord. And uh, I just pray that you'd just bless this sermon, Lord. Bless the end of the book of Acts. And Lord, that we'd get a great spiritual, some great spiritual truths out of this tonight. Pray you right now, you'd fill me with the Holy Spirit and with boldness as I preach your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so they're on this island called Melita, okay? And it says, the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. And so when they say barbarous, that means that they didn't speak Greek. That's, that's basically the barbarous people, because most people in the known world at this time spoke the Greek language. And so that's what people would call a barbarian, right? It wasn't, you know, you think of Conan the Barbarian. Well, you know, they weren't like Conan the Barbarian, okay? They just didn't speak Greek, right? So, and these, it says these people showed us no little kindness, and so that, what that means, that's a phrase, that means that they showed them lots of kindness. Amen. And it says, for they kindled a fire and received us, every one, because of the present rain, and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came out a viper, came out a viper out of the heat and fastened onto his hand. So that's what I was talking about. And you know, there's a couple applications that you could use <laughs> right here. So I'm going to give actually two interpretations, uh, two applications to the, these verses right here. And so there's a non-primary application. And then I'm going to show you the primary application of this. But the non-primary is this picture of a bundle of sticks being cast into the fire. Okay, So what do you think that the non-primary is talking about here? Well, I mean, you could apply this to the bundles of sticks. What is a bundle of sticks? <laughs> okay. Amen. So a bundle of sticks, that's what, yeah, in England, when they ask you for a cigarette, they ask you for a fag, okay? And why do they do that? Well, because it's, it's something that burns, right? And so the Bible says, you know, that there's people that are going to burn in hell for all eternity. And, you know, obviously, I don't want to celebrate people going to hell necessarily here. But, you know, people that hate the Lord, I've already, I've talked about this so much lately, but people that hate the Lord, um, they're going to the lake of fire. And you know what? It's better that they go sooner rather than later. Amen. 
I'm talking about the people that are reprobates, the people that are beyond hope. Yeah. And we know that that doctrine is true. And so Paul, I just think it's interesting that Paul gathers these bundles of sticks and lays them in the fire. Because, you know, the Bible says the saints are going to be uh, judging with the Lord Jesus Christ in the millennial reign. And so there might be times when we have to throw bundles of sticks into the fire also. So, but, um, so again, this is a non-primary application, but a faggot is a bundle of sticks, okay? That's what, that's what a faggot is, and that's the definition of a faggot is a bundle of sticks that's meant to be burned, okay? So he bundles them up and throws them in the fire, right? And that's what's going to happen to every single faggot on the planet yeah. when they die. That's right. On Judgment Day, they're going to be bundled up and cast into the lake of fire, Amen. okay? Amen. And when I say faggot, I'm not talking about literal bundles of sticks. I'm talking about the queers, okay? They're going to be cast into the lake of fire because homos are faggots. Why? Why are they faggots? Because they're meant to be burned. All right? So that is the primary application. And look, that might upset people and whatever. Look, they're ruining our country. They're ruining our world. They're meant to be burned. They're a bundle of sticks. And they're faggots. They're meant to be burned. And that's what's going to happen to him on Judgment Day, Lord. Lord willing. We know that's God's will. And look, it's not just faggots that are meant to be burned, but the application we're talking about is bundles of sticks right now. Okay? If you're uncomfortable, maybe you need to go to the mother baby room and, you know, go to your, your comfort spot or whatever. But I'm going to talk about this for just a few minutes, and then we're going to move on to the primary application. Okay? So turn with me to Genesis chapter 19, verse 24, and we'll see... The first faggots burned in history. All right, Genesis chapter 19, verse number 24. This just jumped out at me at the, in the scriptures when I was studying for this sermon. I don't know why, but maybe when you see freaks every single day when you're out working, maybe when you see them every single time you go to a restaurant, when your kid, you have to hide your kids' faces from them because they're so weird. Me and Richard were working, uh, what was it, yesterday, and we're in 7-Eleven, and I, <laughs> I kid you not, okay? Guys, wear, he's got bleached blonde hair, he's a black guy, bleached blonde hair that's kind of like box-topped or whatever, all black, wearing a dress, wearing giant Kiss-style boots, you know what I'm talking about, the big ones with the big platform boots? Just walking around, so I'm like, no. look, you're, you don't dress like that for no reason. You dress like that because you want to defile people's minds. You want to defile children. It's wicked as hell. I don't want to look at it. And actually, I shouldn't really think it's funny. But when I turn to look at someone dressed like so foolishly, I couldn't help but laugh. I tried to push Richard into him. No. <laughs> I didn't really, but... Anyway, we're in Genesis chapter 19. This is a Bible study. Let's get it together, people. All right, Genesis 19, verse 24. The Bible says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. It was a scorched earth policy for God. Amen. And know why? Because these people were an example of, an example for what is going to come to, the, to these kinds of cities like this. It's the first city of its kind, Sodom, then Gomorrah, and the cities around it. See, it started in Sodom, crept its way into Gomorrah, and all, it said all the cities round about, like little towns and villages, it, it crept into all of them. Why? Because it spreads like a virus. They creep in, and they just destroy people's lives. It says even the children of Sodom surrounded Sodom when and were trying to rape these angels. Okay? Yeah, this is a hard thing to talk about. Yeah, this is a hard thing for children to hear sometimes. But you know what? I'd rather have them be leery of strangers that look like this yep. than to just walk in and not understand what they're looking at. Amen. Hey, we're, we're, we live in this world right now, and it's like a modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. Every time you walk out anywhere, anytime you take your children to the park, anytime you go anywhere... You can't even go out to eat without seeing these disgusting freaks out there. Right. Makes me sick. Amen. And God's going to burn them up. Yeah. 
He's going to throw those bundles of fire, or bundles of sticks into the fire, and they're going to burn. Turn to Jude chapter 1, the only chapter in Jude. Look at verse number 7. So I guess you'd call it Jude 7. Jude verse 7, all the way back at the beginning. So we start at the beginning of the Bible. We're going to go near the end, right before the book of Revelation. And so I'll prove, you know, people are just like, Look, John Getch, uh, I'm sorry, but he just, just, just irritates me so badly. He's, he's saying, we got to be nice to these guys, and everybody should be treated the same, and we should treat them all with respect. You know what? I'm not treating them with respect. Amen. I don't even want to look at them. That's right. I don't want them walking in and defiling this church with their freakery. Could you imagine if Stiletto Boy would have walked into this church you know what's going to happen? He's going to do an about face really quickly, and he's going to be finding himself out on the pavement there. Because we're not letting those freaks in this building. Amen. Hey, there's a church in Vancouver, Washington that's not going to put up with it. Amen. Look at Jude chapter 1, verse 7. It says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, that means uh, queer, right? Queer is a synonym for strange, or set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So God literally rained hellfire down on those people. It wasn't just normal fire, it was everlasting fire Amen. that he rained down on them. So he destroyed them with the very thing that they're going to roast in for all eternity. Pretty interesting. But the fact is, it says eternal fire. There's no way they're getting out of it. Okay, and he said that's an example of them that should afterwards live ungodly. Look, hey, God still feels the same in the New Testament that he did in the Old Testament. Amen. And these bundles of sticks are meant to be burned. Amen. And God is going to burn them again one day. Portland is not going to escape. Vancouver, Washington is not going to escape if they continue to let these freaks in here. Look, and Vancouver, Washington is way more conservative than Portland, Oregon. Right. But you wouldn't know it being on this block and these city blocks around here. Yeah. We got some freak show faggots over there on the corner. Amen. We had these ones over here next door, gone. Amen. And now we got, well, I don't even know what this place is over here. It looks like a bunch of fags are hanging out there too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was a cowboy bar. Steers and queers. Anyway. <laughs> but, you know, the people in Sodom and Gomorrah were literally destroyed by hellfire. And they lift up their eyes. They're, they, lift up, they got destroyed by hellfire, and then they lift up their eyes, and guess what? They were still in eternal hellfire. And that's where they're always going to be. And look, I know this gets uncomfortable. You start thinking about your job situation. Am I on camera right now? Hey, look, we can't, we can't be afraid. Amen. We have to be strong. We have to be valiant for the Lord. So anyway, that's, that's my secondary application to this verse. Um, so anyway, let's move on to the primary application. But, you know, before I do that, I do find it interesting that when Paul threw the fags in the fire, that a snake jumped out and bit him. And so, you know what? When we condemn the homos, just expect your hand might get bitten by the snake. All right? Because for some reason, the devil really likes to use these sodomites uh, for his agenda. It's a big part of it. Look, if you can't see the homos are part of the New World Order, big picture, then you're missing the picture. You know, the vaccinations is a big part of the picture. You know, they're making a one world government, one world religion, one world currency. That's just a fact. Yeah. But they're also trying to make, why is America trying to make all the African nations homos? Because they want the whole world to be overrun by homos. You know what? Because you know what, what a reprobate makes? They'd make more reprobates. And so what's the easiest way to do that? We'll just make the whole, all, everybody homos. You know, then you know for sure they're reprobates. But it also makes it easier for us to know too, which I'm thankful for. Because a lot of times you just don't know. But we do know. You know, and just know this, that when you go, when you stand for the Lord, when you throw these fags in the fire and you, and you, and you put pronounced judgment upon them, just know the devil might bite your hand. So what are you going to do? Just 
Well, I can't believe God let me lose my job over this. Or I can't believe that my family doesn't like me over this anymore. You know what? Whose side are you on? Right. Are you on the Lord's side? Are you on the side of the Bible? Amen. Or are you just, you know, want to, you know, want to hide what you believe? Or maybe you don't believe it. There could be people in this room that don't believe it and they just wince every time I preach about it. Like, please let this pass over. It'll pass. This too shall pass. <laughs> Look, the secondary application is just as important as the primary application to this. Anyway, I'm moving on. All right. So, but you know, Satan took the form of a snake in the Garden of Eden. Remember that. So, do you think that that might be a picture? Of, I, I definitely think it's a picture of, you know, the, the devil is going to attack when we attack his main engine. And his main engine right now is the homo homosexual agenda. I mean, you have to start calling people Z and Zay now and stuff like that. In emails, people are told not to say he or him or she anymore. Z and Zem. I'm never doing that. Ever. Z and Zem. This ain't Dragon Ball Z. God made them in the beginning male and female. And that's all the genders that there are. If you think something different, you're in the wrong church. Anyway, let's go back to the primary application. Uh, turn to Mark chapter 16. Because what ends up happening here is Paul is bitten by this snake. And if you were paying attention during the Bible reading, they think that he's going to get all swollen and, and fall over dead. So obviously this snake is the type of snake that will kill you with one bite. You know, and, and make you swollen and fall over and drop dead. And so when they see that, you know, they think, well, he just was some murderer and he escaped, uh, you know, being, you know, he didn't, he didn't escape. The snake got, came. it was like what comes around. They probably believed in karma or something weird like that, right? And they're like, oh, the snake got him. So, you know, it's like Final Destination or something. You know, they, <laughs> you know, you were supposed to get killed, but you didn't. And then you escaped and then the train ran you over or whatever. Anyway, so that's kind of what they're thinking here. But that could not be any further from the truth. Uh, in Mark chapter 16, verse 14, it says, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat at meat, and abraded them, with their unbelief, abraded them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So it's talking about after Christ was resurrected. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following amen so what is the primary application of this well paul is fulfilling the scriptures that jesus is telling right here okay these are the signs to them that believe they'll cast out devils hey look who, who's here has cast a devil out here has anybody has anybody done any exorcisms here lately okay i didn't think so how many people have spoken in new tongues that you didn't know before anybody has anybody, oh, I mean, I know some of you guys are former AGs, but uh, former Pentecostals, maybe you went through the, you know, you're like, yes, you know, and you like had to do that to fit in or whatever. But I mean, nobody in reality has spoken with new tongues here, okay? It says, and they shall take up serpents. Anybody tucking up any poisonous snakes lately? Anybody got bit while they're by the campfire throwing in bundles of sticks? No. Anybody, you know, and then the snake bit you and it didn't hurt you? No. How about uh, drank some deadly poison and it didn't kill you? Anybody have that happen to them? Anybody lay hands on the sick and have them recover lately? You know why you can't do that? Because this was a special thing that God gave to the apostles. Okay? This died out in the first generation. This was an engine that God used to spread the gospel everywhere. Okay? Now, I'm not saying, look, I've gotten criticized over my, what is it, Todd White, that guy? 
who the 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 fake faith healer. Yeah. I've gotten criticized a lot over that video, but people are taking me out of context. Okay, and it's just a video clip. But look, let me make no mistake about this. I believe that God can do miracles today, just like He did. All throughout the Bible, I think he's continuing to do miracles every day. I think he'll do miracles into the future. But here's what I don't believe. I don't believe that us, we, can do these miracles that it's talking about right here anymore. Because why don't you show me if you can do it then? Why, don't you let, we, why do we pray for people every week? Because God is the one that heals people. God is the one that does these things. And look, he wants us to count on his word. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Okay? The Bible was completed. It's perfect. It's, in, it's without error. All, that's all we need for our faith and practice. He said, blessed are they that, that have not seen and yet believe. When he's talking to Thomas, he said, you know, that he was blessed for seeing. Look, they saw the risen Christ, and they were apostles because of that. But we haven't seen. We believed. See, God wants us to be people of faith. If we could all do all these healings all the time, then people wouldn't have to have faith. They would just believe all the stuff that we do. But, you know, even so, when Moses parted the Red Sea, he still had a, a whole troop of people behind him that still didn't believe. So, look, these special gifts, these special things in, are done away with after the apostles' death. Okay? Look at Acts chapter 19, verse 11. Look at Acts chapter 19, verse 11. I'll just give you an example uh, that we sh have gone over before, but Acts 19, verse 11. For, yeah, Acts 19, verse 11 says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So look at, look at that word, special. If everybody could do these miracles still today, would it be special? No, it was special because one man was able to do these. The apostles also were able to do these certain things. But it says God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. And look, in these verses tonight, we see some of those special miracles that he did. He almost basically fulfills the whole list. And so this is what God was talking about, that these apostles would do these things, okay? Look, you're not going to be a... If you sit up here and try to hold some rattlesnakes in your hand, you're going to get bit and you're going to die. Or you're going to look stupid. You're going to have to go to the hospital. Have you ever seen that guy that gets bit by the snakes and then like he's... Like, people have to walk them out to the hospital. People die from this. There's Pentecostals of the South that, you know, they get the rattlesnakes in their hands, and they're doing these healing things. Look, they get bit by the snakes and get killed. It happens. We can't do these miracles anymore. Turn back to Acts. Oh, actually, uh, you're still in Acts 19. Look, it says, So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. So Paul cast out these evil spirits. Paul healed people that were sick. And Paul was bit by a snake that was poisonous and was able to kill people and didn't die. Paul had all these miracles. He, was a, he had special, he, God wrought special miracles through Paul's hands. So just in case you, you are taking these as, as your verses, it's not going to happen. You know, you want to go try to fight some demons. That's not what God's called us to do. Okay? The apostles were doing those things. But, you know, you're not going to be able to do it. Because those gifts are done away with right now. As far as, you know, God could cast them out. God could heal people. God can do these types of miracles. But it's not going to be by your hands. Uh, Acts chapter 28 verse 4. says, And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his head... They said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds. They repented and said that he was a god. So now you remember in Acts. When, the, the, when he first came to the city and they said that him and Barnabas were gods, and then like five minutes later, they're stoning him. Remember that? So this is the opposite. They think the opposite of him. And I just thought that was pretty interesting that uh, at one point they called you know, Saul a god, and then 
you know, at the beginning and then stoned him and then now they think he's a bad guy, but then they say he's a god later. Anyway, pretty interesting. But um, look at uh, verse, look at verse 8. It says, oh no, verse 7. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So see, Paul had these special powers, and they were they were it says God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So let's let's make no mistake about this. God is the one that gives them the power to do it. So Paul had special power that God gave him to do these miracles. It said, and so, so when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And we, when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. So this is, a, this is a place that received the apostle. They received the word of God, and I'm sure that people... Of, you know, we're saved, obviously, that uh, Paul talked to. And this is a great, you know, little missionary stop for him. So, got bit by a snake, healed a bunch of people. And, you know, the people received them gladly. You know, because the common people receive God gladly. Amen. The common people do. And the, that's what the Bible says. The common right. people received him gladly. So, these guys were barbarians. You know, they were, you know people go, these barbarians. They're common people, though. Good people, and they wanted to hear, and be, and they treated uh, the man of God in a good way here. Amen. So let's move on here. It says in verse eleven, and after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered on the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux, and landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days, and from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium, and after one day, the south wind blew. And we came the next day to Petulio, or whatever, po <laughs> po Pokemon, no, po Petulio, Petulii, oh, Petulii. All right, sorry. And uh, these ones always throw me off. Where we uh, found brethren, and we desired to tarry with them seven days, and so went toward Rome. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appi, Appi Forum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. So, you know, being an encouragement as a believer, sometimes you don't realize how much of an encouragement you can be to people. So these guys, they just heard that Paul had come, and they said, hey, let's go down and see Paul, right? And it says, but look at how Paul responded. It says, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. You never know what your influence on some other Christian's life is going to be. Amen. Do you think that they knew that this part was going to be put in the Bible just because they, you know, it's like, you know, hey, it's Paul, Paul's coming. Hey, let's go see Paul. Let's go encourage him. And, you know, just being an encouragement to people, just say, you know, you never know where someone's at. You know, Paul's gone through a great deal of things. And, he, you know, to, be, to run across some fellow Christians after all this stuff that he went through, you know, that was a great blessing to him, obviously, because it says he thanked God. And he took courage. You know, I don't think we'll ever realize just how important that was for the Apostle Paul to run into brothers yeah. in Christ that came to greet him. You never know, just saying hello to someone. You know, you don't know where they're at. Maybe there's someone in this church that's ready to quit. Maybe someone, you know, they just want to, you know, connect with some friends or something. And, hey, you just walking up and saying, hey, how's it going? You know, how are you doing? And actually caring how they feel. Amen. Actually caring what they're, what's going on in their life. That could have someone take courage. And maybe they'll thank God for you. And they'll take courage in the Lord. Good. You know, Amen. we should be willing to communicate. We should be willing to fellowship with other believers and not just run right out the door. And obviously our church doesn't really have a problem with this. Um, but hey, it's something good to remind you about. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. I'll just give you a couple verses about this really quickly. Hebrews chapter number 13, verse 16. Richard, we're definitely going to have to censor this video. I just want to make sure that you knew that. Anyway... <laughs> Thinking back to the beginning, okay. 
Anyway, Hebrews 13, verse 16 says, But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. And communication with other believers is what it's talking about. You know, what is it when you're communicating, you're talking to people about things, right? That's what communication is. It says to do good and to communicate. Forget not. Don't forget to do that. You know, and that's part of being in fellowship. Yeah. Fellowship isn't just standing around doing nothing. Sometimes you got to communicate. Hey, and you know what the good thing to communicate is? Things you, you get out of the Bible. Amen. That's what I like that our church does that. I like it when I see someone standing there with their Bible with someone else. If they're in the corner whispering, then I might get a little <laughs> weirded out. But, you know, if we're just communicating things of the Bible and just talking about the things of God, you know, that's, that's a great thing to do. And it can encourage someone. You never know how you're going to encourage somebody. You might never know, but they know. And uh, so turn to Psalm 133, verse number 1. Psalm 133, verse number 1. I just thought that was really cool how people came, they knew that it was the Apostle Paul, and they came to greet him and encourage him. Because you know who he's facing? Nero. A wicked, wicked person. Now, I wouldn't suggest kids look at him up, but men, if you ever have a chance to look up Nero and the things that he... He's going to face off against a type of the Antichrist, basically. A really, really wicked person. So I'm sure he wanted to take courage with this. But anyway, so Psalm 133, verse 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. See, not just to dwell together, but be in one accord. You know, believing the, you know, believing the same things, believing the Bible. And obviously we're not going to always believe exactly the same on every single thing. But on the main things, we should be in unity. Yeah. And I think our church is at unity in this church. It's great to go to a church. I mean, just think back to the churches that you were going to before. Yeah. Not unity. Yeah. It was not unity. It was, that guy's a Calvinist. That guy's Lordship Salvation. That guy believes you have to repent of your sins. This guy, I don't even know what he believes. He's so crazy. He's not even saved. You know, this person, they're still Catholic. They got the rosary in their hand. I mean, this person's reading the NIV. This person's got the NASB. The pastor isn't even preaching the Bible. <laughs> He's telling one scripture and doesn't even know how to expound upon it and then telling 15 stories. That's not unity. Church, a church like this has unity, and you should be thankful for that. Uh, Ecclesiastes 4, verse number 9. Ecclesiastes 4, verse number 9. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse number 9. The Bible says two are better than one because... They have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, and one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. So I think this is a great verse for soul winning too. Two are better than one. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ sent people out two by two. Amen. This thing where people are going soul winning by themselves all the time, I mean, if you have to do that, I understand, but I don't... Look, and, and I just want to say this really quickly. When you're with a partner, don't leave them. Amen. I don't want you leaving your partner, you know, just because you're bored because they're giving the gospel and you're not. Amen. You stick with your partner. It's called being a silent partner, not a silent person that walks away yeah. and starts doing their own thing. We're going out two by two for a reason or two and th or three and three or whatever, but at least two. And I don't want people leaving unless you're trying to fend off a pit bull or something, you know, or whatever. You know, you're trying to cut some reprobate off of the past while someone can pray, but still you're with that partner. I just want it to be known that in this church, when you go soul winning, I would prefer, and as a matter of fact, I want you to go and stick with your partner and stay with them. And hey, you know, don't get on your phone and start like, you know, playing Pokemon Go or something while they're trying to lead someone to the Lord. Because I'll guarantee you're not getting your reward at that point. All right, you've lost your you, you Behold, you have your reward. You got Pikachu with the detective hat on. Okay? <laughs> Don't do that. Hey, pray for your partner. Try to keep these dogs at bay. Try to, you know, kiss kids and whatever. I don't know what you got to do. But get, keep people away from the person you're trying to get saved. 
Amen? So, anyway, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him is alone when he falleth. And hey, you know another good reason to have two by two is because your, your witness by yourself is not credible. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So if you have something happen at the door and they're accusing you of something and you have two people or three people, hey, that's, that's credible in a court of law. It's credible according to God. <coughs> you don't want anybody to be able to call your integrity into question. So that is, I mean, I think that that's the, the importance. You know, for one thing, you get more work done. For the other thing, you know, when one is... When one falls, hey, you're there to pick the other person up. Amen. So, uh, and it says if two lie together, then they can have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So look, hey, we're, we're better with numbers, all right? A threefold cord is not quickly broken. We're talking about rope here. You know, it's harder to break, you know, those single strand I mean those three stranded ropes, those ropes that are bound together, than it is for like a string or, you know. So basically the Bible is teaching that, you know, we're better off in groups, right? And so when we come together as a church, I mean, we're a 100 cord fold, right? Or fold cord. So it's good for us to dwell in unity together. It's good for us to go soul winning together with somebody else. It's good for us to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. And hey, you know, it's, it's easy to take down someone by themselves compared to, easy, to how, if you have three people with yeah. you, right? Um, back to Acts chapter 28. Let's look at verse number 16. Acts 28, verse number 16. Acts 28, verse 16, the Bible says, And when he came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself, with a soldier that kept him. So he got to get out on work release and, you know, he got to be able to go and visit people and go do things, you know, before he was heard of Caesar. And, you know, the, the Romans were good to him. You know, up until a certain point, they were okay with Christianity. Some of them just didn't care, you know, but they weren't, you know, like even with Pop Pontius Pilate, like he really didn't care. You know, he didn't care. The only reason why he cared is because he was the governor and had to take care of of what he was taking care of. But otherwise, they, you know, a lot of them didn't care. You know, well, go ahead, believe whatever God you want to. And it wasn't any big deal to them. So, but this guy, you know, he went through things with Paul that, that you know, he saw what Paul did on the island. He saw the counsel that was given over the ship when it was about the wreck and how he told them not to sail away. And they did anyway, and then they start. Remember, they started listening to him last last week. Maybe they started listening to him, and so Paul kind of became this leader. And the centurion, you know, they were going to kill all the all the prisoners on the boat, and the centurion delivered him from that fate, because that's what normally they would do. Because the Romans didn't care, you know, they were pretty uh, ruthless in some aspects. But anyway, look at verse 17. It says, and it came to pass after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, men and brethren. Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our father, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who when they had examined me would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel... I am bound with this chain. Now, what is the hope of Israel? Jesus Christ, amen. The hope of Israel is Jesus. It's not the land. It's not all this other stuff. You know, it's not the covenant that he made with them in the past. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the hope of Israel. And hey, you know what? You are Israel amen. if you believe on Christ. Right. And so we are spiritual Israel. You know, people get so mad about that and they say, well, you're just spiritualizing things. Well, this is a spiritual book, okay? The New Testament has a lot of, you know, if you, if you read the Old Testament, they refer to some of the Old Testament scriptures and it's talking about spiritual truths. Yep. It's not talking about uh, everything is just, you know, 
it, there's spiritual truths that you, you know, they didn't even know who Jesus was in the Old Testament. How did they find out? Because of the spiritual truths in the Old Testament that were revealed by the New Testament. Amen. And so when people accuse us of being spirit, too spiritualizing, you know, look, the Bible's a spiritual book and we, some things are spiritual, yeah. okay? And we are the spiritual Israel, okay? Yeah. And Paul is saying, hey, for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. And so I kind of like in this story, what, what, where I, my mind works in this story a little bit. Look, we've gone over the Jews several times. And look, we all know that doctrine pretty well. But I've also gone after the old IFB a lot, haven't I? But I'm going to do it again. Because here's the thing. This is what I like in the, new IF, or the old IFB to being like. The Jews in the, old, in the, new, you know, in the new Testament. Is that some of them were saved. Some of them were able to be saved. Some of them, you know, Paul was able to talk to at the synagogues and draw them out. But a lot of them just were like, yeah, I'm going to stick with, you know, yeah. being a Jew. Right. And so a lot of this false doctrine has crept into old IFB churches. And I talked about this on Sunday. But all this false doctrine has creeped in. And it's like, it's like they've become like the Jews. The Jews turn from believing the right things to believing in work salvation. The Baptists have turned from believing by faith and turned to believing in works. Yep. Right. And that works is packaged in repent of your sins, yep. lordship salvation, Amen. and things like that. Or you have to show that you were saved by your works, which is complete garbage. Yeah. And hey, so if someone quit smoking, is that because they believed in Jesus? I mean, people quit smoking all the time that aren't saved. So you're telling me that that shows whether they're saved or not? That's ridiculous. If someone goes soul winning, does that automatically say to you that they're saved? Hey, Tyler Baker went soul winning. Dominique Davis went soul winning. I mean, you can't judge based upon the works. You can't. Because those, wor you know, those works aren't, aren't what make you saved. You know, what, you know how, people, how we know someone's saved? By what they believe. Yep. It's faith. It's ultimately faith. It's absolutely faith. If someone says, I believe in Jesus Christ, that he died for me on the cross, he was buried, he rose again the third day, I put all my trust in him, I have everlasting life, there's no way I can lose it. You know what? I'm more apt to say that that person is saved than someone that says, well, you know, when I got saved, I got saved all the way. I had lost all my desire to quit or to smoke cigarettes. I lost all my desire to drink alcohol. I quit listening to worldly music. I quit going to the movies. You know what that is? That's a works resume. Yeah. It is. I'll tell you what, I'll side with the person that's still smoking cigarettes, Amen. still drinking, still going to the bars, but says all the things that I said, that they believe in Jesus, they have everlasting life, as opposed to this works-based salvation person that's telling me of all the things they repented of, and that's why you know they're saved. Right. Complete garbage what Amen. pastors are preaching these days, and I'm really sick of it. Amen. But I liken this story to the old IFB because basically this is Paul's last-ditch effort to try to bring these people out. And look, you know why we preach these sermons about the old IFB? Because we want them to, to go back to what they should be. Amen. It's not that we hate them. Right. But I'll tell you what, I want the saved pastors of the old IFB to join and be, you know, they don't have to believe all the, you know, the Zion, you know, they can still believe in Zionism. It's stupid. Yeah. But they can still believe in that. Look, if their faith alone, salvation by faith alone, Eternal security and King James only, hymns, you know, all that soul winning. I'm good. But a lot of them will just say, we're dangerous, we're heretics, blah, 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 blah. <coughs> and like the old IFB pastors, when they say, this is kind of like the old IFB pastors when they say they've never heard of Pastor Anderson. Which really, I kind of find that hard to believe, but I'm sure that there's some pastors that have never really truly heard of them. But I really find it hard to believe that, that, you know what I mean? And that's what these guys are saying right here. Look at verse 21, it says, And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came 
showed or spake any harm of thee. Which that might be true, but you know, that's what, that's what kind of happens when you, sometimes you'll go to a church that's like Hiles. You know, they'll put up with you because you're so winning and all that stuff, but eventually they stop agreeing with you and they'll just want you to leave. Yeah. Right? And what amazes me is that these pastors will continue to let these heretics yeah. and these weirdos to stay in their churches yeah. and just throw out a soul winner, a tither, someone that's fired up, someone that wants to help, and they'll throw that person out. You know what that makes me? It makes me suspect of them. It makes me suspect of the fact that they're even saved at all. And so that's why I liken this to the old IFB, because these guys right here, Paul's giving them a chance. He, you know, this was his custom. When he got into a town, what did he do? He went straight to the synagogue and tried to get all the people that were on the Lord's side with him, right? Look at verse 22. It says, But we desire to hear thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And so what are they saying? We know your cult, that evil is spoken against it. Isn't that what they say when they're talking about like a sect? A sect would be like a branch. You know, they're saying, well, this sect is evil spoken of. So they, have they heard of Jesus or not? Yes. So they're saying, well, we don't know about you, Paul. But we know that the sect that you belong to is only evil spoken of. And so that's what these old IFB pastors will do too. They'll say, well, I don't know about you, but this Anderson guy, these new IFB people, only evil is spoken, spoken against it. You can just get out. What are they afraid of? You know what they're afraid of? They're afraid of being called to the carpet on their non-soul winning they're afraid of being called to the carpet on their stupid beliefs. Amen. And look, you shouldn't just go, look, that's preached against. Don't go into somebody else's church and try to change it. Right. It's not going to work, first of all. But can you help it? Yeah, you might be able to help it, but you're not going to be able to help it by just going and going, look, pastor, I just want to tell you, first of all, you're wrong on this, you're wrong on this, you're wrong on this, you're wrong on that, you're wrong on this. Look, you're never going to change that. And I, you know, a lot of noobs get into this movement and they think that they're going to do that. Well, because I know more about the rapture than the pastor does. Yeah, maybe after you watch the video 500 times and you have to write notes down. But, so, I mean, there are some, some bad people that, or maybe they're not even bad people, they're just bad and I don't know I what am I was the word I'm looking for they they're on yeah they're unskilled and they go in and they think they're gonna change the church that they're going to they don't want to move to an old a new IFB church they want to stay and change the one that they're at they think they can change the Presbyterian church that they're at they think they can change the community church and in, in the King James only look you're not gonna change them so how are these how is this compared to the to the old IFB though, it says, you know, because if you go into a church like that, look, I, was at, I went to a church and I told the pastor what I believed slowly, but I wasn't, you know, I just said, look, I'm not gonna go out and try to proselytize people in your church about what I believe. <clears throat> I just wanna be a blessing. And that's what I told them. That's the truth. Yeah. But see, what happens is their people start coming to you. Yeah. Yep. And they start wanting to know, well, what do you, what's up with this? What's up with that? Why do you believe this? And they'll come and it's like, what am I supposed to do? Lie? Yeah. I'm not going to lie about what I believe. Yeah. But they can see that something's different about a new IFB person. Yeah. Hey, look, their wives are wearing dresses. They're tithing. They're soul winning. They're doing all this stuff. And they want to know. You know, and the church we went to, we brought a whole bunch of people to that church. So when we left, all those people left with us, but it wasn't like we were splitting their church. They were never really on board with that kind of doctrine. They really just wanted an, a new IFB church, and that's you know, what they wanted to do. Look, we have liberty to go whatever church we want to. But anyway, it says that there, it's only evil spoken of. But they said they desire to hear 
You know, we desire to hear what thou thinkest. And so pastors in these old FB churches will say, well, I just want to know what you believe. And then you tell them everything that you believe, and they're like, get out. <laughs> it's, it's true. It says that when they appointed a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading and concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Hey, and a lot of people in churches like ours could sit there and expound on things from morning to evening with a pastor of one of these old IFB churches. We can, we can explain it, but here's the thing. They won't always receive it. Right. And look, there's some diamond in the rough pastors out there. There's some ones that are saved and they're like, hey, maybe there is something to this. You know, Pastor McMurtry just for a long time just kind of you know, finally he decided, he, you know, after everything happened with Pastor Menace, he finally decided to get into the fight. Yeah. He couldn't just stay idle anymore. But there's a lot of pastors out there that agree with us, but they're too afraid to come forward. Right. And that needs to change. But you know what? <clears throat> they want to hear what we believe. But a lot of times they'll hear it and then they'll kick those people out because those are the wolves. The wolves are the ones that want to kick. Like as soon as they know you listen to Pastor Anderson, you're out the door. That's kind of the new policy. Yeah. But look at verse 24. It says, And some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. See, some of the things, like, and, you know, obviously the primary application of this is that some people believed the things that Paul spoke about the gospel, some believe not. In the old IFB, some people are going to believe the things. Look, I was in the old IFB, and I became new IFB. You know why? Because I love the truth more than I love some pastor. I love the truth more than I love lies. You know, and when I started hearing preaching, you know what? I was hungry for preaching, hard preaching. You know what I looked up? Baptist preaching. And I saw like the white background Pastor Anderson with the door. Remember with the door right there? And he, you know, there's this little guy up there just, ah! He just like, I'm like, whoa, okay. Well, I don't know if this is what I was looking for, but I sit there and listen to it for a few minutes. And, but, you know, that's what, what I typed in Baptist preaching because I was like, where's all the Baptist preaching at? Everything shared on Facebook was like some garbage theologian, some T.D. Jakes, some Joel Osteen, but I never saw people share Baptist preachers. And I'm a Baptist. And I've been a Baptist for the last 20 years. And I want to hear Baptist preaching. So that's how I, I mean, that's really how I found Pastor Anderson in the first place. I just typed in Baptist preaching. You know what you type it? When you type in, type in right now on your phone, on YouTube, type in Baptist preaching and see what comes up. Just do it as an experiment. Anyway, but it says some believe not, some believe the truth, some need more time. So in these old IFB churches, some of them just need more time. And look, we need to be patient with the ones that need more time. We don't have to go scorched earth on everything, right? Look at verse 25, it says, And they agreed not among themselves, they and when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and not perceive. For their heart, the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. It's the same, you know, just like the Jews back then, they just were shut down. Their ears stopped hearing, their eyes stopped seeing, and they, they just didn't want to understand. And it's the same thing with the old IFB now. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their heart is wax gross. They have eyes, but they can't see the truth. You know, even though you can sit there and show them clear verses, you know, that Jesus went to hell for three days and three nights. That's what the Bible says. Amen. As Jonas was three days and three nights in the heart of earth, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Right? right. Jonas went was a picture of Christ going to hell for three days and three nights. As he was, you know, three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. I, I don't think I said that. The whale's belly. So shall, I, you know, the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Christ was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We know that hell is in the center of the earth. We know that's true. The Bible says that he, his soul wasn't left in hell. 
Hey, it's easy to prove that from Scripture, but you know what they'll say? That's heresy. Yep. Right. Your eyes are not seeing what the Scriptures are saying. Yeah, right. Your ears can't hear anymore. Yeah. You're, you're just... And, and when someone gets to that point, it's like, how can you help someone? What do you think about that person? Do you think they're saved or not saved? And people, Pastor Anderson gets a lot of flack for this, saying, hey, if you don't believe the Bible, you're not saved. True. What else can I say? Amen. What else can I say? Right. If I show you a plain verse in the Bible and you say, I don't believe that, you're not saved. Amen. There's no way, or, what, what other way can you interpret that? And that's what Paul was saying. Hey, this people, this, the heart of this people is waxed gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed. They don't want to see it. They don't want to hear it. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted that I should heal them. They don't want it. And so, just like the Jews back then refused to see the truth, the modern Pharisees do the same thing today. They're called the old IFB. And look, we've tried and tried to reach out to them. And look, I hope that more pastors come over to our side. I hope more people in those churches come over to their side, our side. Amen. I hope that they see the truth. I hope that they realize someday they're sitting in a candlestickless church. Hey, if you don't got a soul winning pro program, you're a dead church. God's taken and removed that candlestick from you. Amen. You're not a legit church anymore. That's what the Bible teaches. I don't care if you like that or not. It's just the truth. So some people are sitting in literal morgues. Yeah. You know, they say the church is supposed to be a hospital. Well, your hospital is the morgue. Yeah. They're, they're all dead. That's right. Might as well just get out now and go and serve your life in a good church. You know, wherever that may be. They can't see the plain scriptures. They can't understand them. They hear the preaching that comes out of churches like Faithful Word Baptist Church, Verity Baptist Church, Mountain Baptist Church, Old Path Baptist Church, Steadfast Baptist Church, Faith Baptist Church, First Works Baptist Church, Temple Baptist Church, Pure Words Baptist Church, Sure Foundation Baptist Church, and they can't hear the truth anymore. They just can't hear it. They say it's a lie. They say we're, we're heretics. No, they've lost their way. They've let the infiltrators come in and take over. You know what? And I'm moving on. Well, I, I, this isn't the last sermon I'm ever going to preach about it, though. I'll tell you that. Hurt my hand on that one. Um, I'm moving on though. And again, I hope these saved pastors that are pastoring churches in the old IFB, I hope they wake up. Look, don't worry about losing your friends. They're dead anyway. They're dead. Amen. They're dead. Flip them over, put a fork in them, they're done. Why are you so worried about your alma mater? You know, this isn't, you know, we're not secular, this isn't the secular world. You know, just because you went to West Virginia, <laughs> just because I went to Bible Baptist College in Missouri or whatever, or Golden Calf Baptist College, that shouldn't mean that your allegiance is to people that went to that college. Your allegiance should be to Jesus Christ and this book right here. So I'm moving on just like Paul moved on. But I hope that more people continue to follow. I hope more people continue to get saved. I hope the old IFB comes around and joins forces with us. Hey, there's 6,000 Baptist churches in this country. I hope that they move on at some point and move with us, but it doesn't look like that's what they're doing. Because what I talked about at the beginning of the sermon was the bundles of sticks. And my belief has always been that once you let the bundles of sticks into the churches, it's over. It's over. Turn the lights out. It's done. I mean, we, we don't even know what the magnitude of what Paul Chapel is teaching and letting be preached out of his pulpit is doing right now to the Baptist Churches of America. You know what? They like to call Pastor Anderson a cult leader, but I'll tell you what. Pastor Anderson's books are not passed around in every single church in this country like Paul Chapel's books are. And that name of that book, Continue. Continue, that's the name of the book. You know what? Paul Chapel's in every single Baptist church. 
And these pastors are letting him come in with his doctrine and just take over their church. And so, you know, what's happening is that, you know, and while they're calling us cult leaders, they have Paul Chapel bringing every single pastor in the whole country over to their weak church. And I know, I know there's Baptist pastors that don't go to it, but I'll tell you what, a vast majority of the, of the, of the pastors around here are Paul Chapel disciples. They drank the chapel Kool-Aid, and you know, you know what, what they're going to follow? Everything that his church follows. Yep. And you know what their church is saying? Let the queers in. Don't let, don't, oh, don't be mean to them. No, kick them out. Yeah. That's always going to be our policy. I'm never changing on that. Amen. You want to go to whatever weak sauce, <laughs> Baptist church, and go for it. You know, chocolate cake Baptist Whatever you want to go, you, you, there's lots of churches. There, you could go to Majesty, where the pastor's wife's hair is as long as his, you know, <laughs> this short. Go on over. You want to worship the American flag every week? Yep. Uh, go, go to Majesty. Purple Mountains Majesty, right over there, just right across town over on St. John's, you can go there. I bet they let the queers in their church too. Yeah. You know, uh, what, what else? Amazing... Not amazing grace up there where they teach you got to repent of your sins. You know, we left that church. You know what? Nobody from that church will even talk to us. Even our own family members that go there won't talk to us. Our own family that we had Christmases together with will not talk to us anymore. You know what? I count all that but dung. Amen. I count all that but dung. Yeah. I want to go and serve Christ if that means forsaking some repent of your sins, heretics, and whatever. Yeah. You know, I'll have Christmas with my brothers and sisters in Christ here. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> anyway, so I know I'm going a little long here. I'm almost done. Um, Acts 28, 28. Let's move on here. Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So there's a happy ending to the story of Acts. And you know what? 2,000 years later, we're sitting here in church. Thank you, Apostle Paul. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God the Father. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for allowing us to be partakers of, you know, as Gentile believers in here. I'm thankful to God that we have a great church we can go to. And you know what? For the rest of eternity, we're going to have rewards together in heaven. Amen. Now, 9 o'clock again is the time to go home up in heaven at my house. Water slide time's over. <laughs> I'm going to my 13 and a half foot bed. But anyway, I'm going to be happy to serve the Lord Jesus Christ for all eternity with all the people in this room here. Amen. So Acts ends on a great note. Paul is well at the end. Historians say that Paul was killed by Nero, and that is an extra-biblical account. Here's the thing. You can't trust secular history too much. Okay, the, I, I'm just going to read this really quickly. It says the exact details of St. Paul's death are unknown, but, to, but tradition holds that he was beheaded in Rome and thus died as a martyr for his faith. His death was perhaps part of the executions of Christians ordered by the Roman Emperor Nero following the great fire in the city in 64 um, AD. So people say that he was killed by Nero. Maybe it's true. I don't know. That's what tradition says. But you know what traditions are? Vain. Yeah. You, don't, you, can't, you don't know if you can trust them. Now, I believe that probably a lot of the apostles were killed. I believe that believers were killed. There's no doubt that there was a Roman persecution of Christians. But we don't really know what happened to Paul. But I'll tell you what, at the end, Paul is preaching the gospel. Paul is getting people saved. And they were not forbidding people to come to him. And maybe he just died of old age. You know, we don't know. But I'll tell you what, this is the, you know, the Gospels springboard us to Acts, which springboard us, and, and, and we can go back and we can see all the things that the Apostle Paul did in the New Testament. And, uh, you know, I'm just I'm thankful for this book. Uh, it's been a great pleasure of mine to teach it. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you so much. Uh, for the word of God, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us, Lord, and for the Apostle Paul, what a great man he was, and all the apostles. Pray, Lord, that you'd help us, Lord, to be fired up as a church 
and Lord, to just forsake the, forsake the things of the world and to cling to the things in the Bible, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.